and welcome to today's chemistry lecture video. And today we're going to talk about a topic that's very, very close to my heart, which is the periodic table, because the periodic table tells us the origin of the universe, because all these elements on the periodic table just give us this brief history of time of where we come from as human beings, where all elements come from, how do they form, how are they arranged in perfect, unique harmony. So the periodic table is a very, very important topic because it's a, it's a story about us. It's the story of humanity. It's the story of how the universe was formed. So much like uh, the math that we do in uh, matrices, let's say when you do matrices, you have things known as, a, if you have like a matrix, maybe a two by two matrix, we usually say these um, rows and these are columns. The periodic table is arranged in much less the same way, but in, instead of calling them rows and columns, we call them groups and periods. So if, for example, here we have an example of our periodic table right there. We have got vertical columns like that. So these vertical columns that are stretching out like that are known as groups of the periodic table. And we'll later come to understand that all elements that are in the same group have got certain physical and chemical properties that they have in common because of their position within that group. We also have uh, certain vertical columns like so. And these vertical columns are known as uh, periods in the periodic table. Not that period where we were referring to the menstrual cycle, we're going to do that in biology, but periods in terms of elemental arrangements of different atoms on the periodic table. All right, with my case, uh, there it is. So by definition of the periodic table, I really, really love this definition. So this definition on the periodic table, it states that it's an arrangement and classification of elements. So it's not just a mere arrangement, but it's trying to classify elements. So an arrangement and classification of elements and can be used to predict the properties of elements from trends that are observed. So based on the particular position of that element in the periodic table, we can classify and arrange elements and also predict the properties of that given element. If I say, all right, if I go across a period, I'm losing metallic character, so those will be gases on the periodic table. These will be metals, transitional metals have certain properties. So if I just spot an element, if someone tells me sodium or potassium, I'll be able to predict uh, the physical and chemical properties of that element based on its uh, position. And that's what's known as trends. A trend is uh, a, an observable pattern that you can, um, an observable pattern that you can uh, uh, use to determine the physical and chemical properties. So a trend is just an observable pattern. If you see that observable pattern over and over again, we can call that a trend. So if you see a question which says, what are some of the periodic trends of group one elements? Think about those observable uh, uh, things that you can find based on that element in that group. Is it boiling point? Is it density? Is it atomic radius? So that's what we mean when we uh, say a trend. So an arrangement, and classification of elements and can be used to predict properties of elements from trends that are observed. Remembering that trends are just simply observable, um, observable properties that you can uh, observe. They're just patterns on the periodic table. 
So the periodic table organizes elements in actually a particular way, uh, whether physical or chemical properties. And we have a known, we have about 118 known elements so far. So how are these elements arranged in terms of the periodic table? So you will notice that when we have an electronic configuration, uh, in terms of an element, we usually put an electronic configuration, let's say a given element X, and we can say maybe Z, and we can say uh, Z, and let's say, uh, let me say, because A is for atomic number, so, or, all right, it's actually okay. So we can say Z, and we can say A, and we can say, all right, can say A, we'll say that's the, usually the mass number. The mass number is what's in the nucleus. Remember an atom is so small, it's made of mostly empty space. So that's the mass number, that's what's in the nucleus. But we're mostly interested in the smaller number, they are known as the atomic number. So the atomic number gives us the number of protons that are found in an atom. And the atomic number or the number of protons is the characteristic uh, thing that points out, that points us to this particular element. Hydrogen has an atomic number one. It means all hydrogen atoms, if I want to identify that, okay, this is actually an element of hydrogen, I'll look at the atomic number. If I want to know helium to all helium uh, atoms, if he, helium is an element because of its atomic number. So the atomic number is the one that tells us this is an element. No wonder we can define isotopes as things that are having the same atomic number, but the mass, what's in the nucleus, maybe it has a, a different number of neutrons. So what's in the nucleus is different, but the number of protons will always be the same. And that's what we are targeting. If I want to identify an element, I will arrange it in such a way that it's in, um, it's in terms of atomic number. Usually it's in the form of increasing atomic number. It's a trend on the periodic table that we're going to discuss. But I want you to know that from today onwards, what identifies an element as an element is the atomic number or the number of protons inside the nucleus. Hope you're understanding. All right, uh, I just told you about uh, the arrangement, the, the groups and periods. So groups in uh, uh, groups uh, are your vertical columns. Vertical columns of elements, no, uh, right? Vertical columns of elements in the periodic table. The group, because we have got periods and groups are vertical, all right? So we have vertical elements in the periodic table. And what you have to know and pay particular attention is that the group number indicates the number of valence electrons in an atom of an element. So the group number is going to tell us how many electrons does that element have in the outermost shell electron? So by the way, I want to get this uh, known to, to you people clear now. Valency is different from valence electrons. So please, the trend that's observed is that all elements in the same group have the same valence electrons. They have the same number of electrons in their outermost shell, but they don't necessarily have the same bonding power. The bonding power is going to differ because valency is the bonding ability. How many electrons do I have to gain or lose to have a stable octet configuration? That's what valency is. But valence electron indicates the number of electrons in the outermost shell. So please uh, differentiate this to the trend that you're supposed to say is all elements in the same group have the same number of electrons in their outermost shell or the same valence electrons. 
So these are just uh, a few examples. So if you look at the electronic conf configuration, for the first three elements in group one, we have the same number of electrons uh, in the outer shell. Let me use a brighter color, maybe purple. We have the same number of electrons in the outer shell, lithium 2,1, uh, sodium 2, 8,1, potassium 2881. We're going to talk about how to write these electronic configurations in future uh, uh, lecture chemistry videos. If you look at uh, group two, beryllium, magnesium, and calcium, they all have two valence electrons in their outermost shell. And I also want you to notice that because they all have two valence electrons in their outermost shell, the type of ions that they form will be similar. They'll all have, if it's group one, positive one charges because metals tend to lose electrons. Uh, same with group two, it will have uh, a plus two. Uh, group seven elements are non-metal, so they'll gain electrons and have a negative charge. So they'll all form ions that have got the same charge either cations or anions. So the period is the horizontal row of elements in the periodic table. The period indicates the number of shells in an element, and the number of shells in an element tends to increase as you go down each period. No wonder we can actually say the atomic radius increases as you are going down the period. So as you are going down, the number of shells increases and as the number of shells increases the atomic radius the atomic radius is the distance that an electronic shell is um, from the nucleus so the distance so that's the atomic nucleus there where the entire mass is the atomic radius will be that distance there and the atomic radius will be that distance over there, and the atomic radius will be the distance from an electronic shell to radius there. Remember, it's uh, uh, electrons orbit the nucleus in a circular pattern, so we can make atomic radius. So the atomic radius increases as you are going down each period. So it means the elements are actually uh, getting bigger. And we can say uh, elements in the same period will have the same number of electronic shells. So all elements, in, uh, this is another trend. So if you are in the same period, you are going to have an identical number of electronic shells. Uh, let's say uh, this is a, another property of a period. I find this very interesting. So as you are going across a period, and let me show you what across a period means using an arrow that I'm going to draw in an amazing green color. So as we are going across a period, that's what it means by across a period, we are losing metallic character. Losing metallic character. I hope you have seen this very clearly in amazing green. So as we are going across a period, we are losing metallic character. It means the metallic character will start off with metal, then we go to metalloids, and eventually all the elements are going to end up being non-metals. The majority of elements on the periodic table are actually metals. Therefore, as we are going across the period, we are losing metallic character. That's another observable trend in the periodic table. The electronic, stru uh, the electronic structure across a period, uh, the number of valence electrons increases by one successfully. So you're going to if you are going across a period, hydrogen, helium, uh, uh, lithium, etc. As you are going, as you are going across the period were increasing uh, atomic number. So it's going to like go from like 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, across that period. Uh, but what happens to atomic radius as you are going across the period? Because you are losing metallic character, the elements are going from being metals to being non-metals. So they are generally becoming smaller. 
So because they are generally becoming smaller, the nuclear pool, so the nucleus, remember protons are positively charged. Because protons are positively charged and electrons are negatively charged, it means there is a strong electrostatic force of attraction between the nucleus and the electronic shells. And that electrostatic attraction is called a nuclear force a nuclear force and because we have got a very strong nuclear force between the nucleus and the outer most shell electrons the nuclear pool is so small that the atoms themselves the whole element is going to start to shrink so as you are going across the period the nuclear force is becoming stronger meaning the elements uh, meaning the uh, the atomic radius is going to start reducing in Sides. All right, so I've talked about metallic character. It, uh, we're going from metals, non metals, um, metals, metalloids, and then eventually non metals. So you've seen that across the period decrease in metallic character. All right, so we're, we're going to talk about uh, four, three types of um, trends in the periodic table that I want you to know. We're going to start off with uh, group one, then we're going to go to uh, these group seven, ele uh, group seven elements, which are known as uh, halogens. Then we're going to talk about noble gases, and we'll end with our transitional metals. So let's start off with group one. So these are known as alkaline uh, metals because they are prone to oxidation. With um, they are prone to oxidation, and an alkali. An alkali is either a metal oxide or a metal hydroxide. So all these, if, if we can say something like lithium oxide or sodium hydroxide, these things, these two things made by oxidation are known as alkali. No wonder they are called alkali metals because by definition, an alkali is either a metal oxide or a metal hydroxide. And these elements in group one actually have interesting trends, which we have to talk about right about now. Hope you're ready. First of all, these elements are so soft. They are so soft such that you can actually cut them with a piece of knife I really hope you come from schools with uh, a good laboratory system where you can actually, this is sodium, this is sodium metal. Sodium is so cool, so soft, you can actually cut it with uh, metal, but you have to be very careful because these things are very, very reactive with oxygen and water. So you have to be careful, you have to wear your um, personal protective equipment like your goggles and lab coats. So that's the first uh, trend in terms of physical properties. These metals are actually very soft. They are shiny, so you can also say they are very shiny, very silvery colored um, metals, very shiny surfaces. Again, that's sodium. They are very reactive and actually as you are going down the group, reactivity increases. Let me, uh, okay, so uh, low, de uh, low density is what, oh, we're still talking about physical properties. So they have got very low densities. Remember, density of water is around uh, one gram per cubic centimeter. So most of these elements can actually float on water. So the first three elements, because they have got low densities, they can actually float on water. Again, that's sodium. Uh, floating on water, but it's reacting explosively with water. So you, you are seeing all these fiery stuff happening there. So most of these, they have very low densities and very low melting points. If we were to talk about physical properties, there are low melting points, low boiling points. So low melting points, low boiling points, low densities. Uh, they are very soft and shiny elements. Let's talk about the fun stuff. So you've seen this um, as the sodium hydroxide there, no wonder they are called alkaline. 
because they easily react with um, at, uh, atmospheric oxygen. So alkali metals lower down in the group react explosively to oxygen. So I want uh, to explain this clearly. Why, when, why, as we are going down the group, are things getting more reactive? Because you remember that nuclear force that I just told you about. A smaller element like that has a strong nuclear force. So the electrons are being held by this nuclear electrostatic attraction. So strong nuclear force. However, remember it's the electrons that usually react. Most of the times protons and uh, neutrons do not react. But as you are going down, you're increasing the number of electronic shells. And this electron outside is like, oh, I'm far away from the, from the nucleus. So I'm not experiencing a very strong force. I'm experiencing a weak uh, nuclear force. So the electron will be like, oh, I'm going to react. So because it's very far away from the nucleus, you know, and as you are going down the group, these metals start becoming very hyperreactive. Uh, so let's talk about the, the uh, flame color test. So if you have a Bunsen burner and you have some powders crushed, because remember these metals are soft, so you can easily grind them up and make some form of powders. And if you sort of, this is a Bunsen burner. This is our Bunsen burner looks like, and you can connect it to gas. So a gas supply and boom that's your flame there so if you get your hand like that let me draw some hand with some uh, powder of lithium or the, if you sprinkle some some lithium powder there the flame will be red the flame will be red the flame will be red Them will be red. If it's a uh, lithium, it will be yellow. If you sprinkle some lithium powder on this Bunsen burner, it will be yellow. If it's a uh, potassium, it will be sort of a uh, uh, paper. Me like is some sort of paper color, so you can just say paper. Uh, rubidium, it will be red. Uh, cesium, it will be blue. Uh, all right, you get the picture. So know these color codes because most of the times in your MCQs, they would usually ask you such question. If I get a, a, a lithium metal and I sprinkle some, some, some lithium powder on a Bunsen burner, what color am I going to have? It will be red. It will require a lot of visualization techniques and memorization techniques. So these are the reactions that I was saying. So lithium, uh, it reacts quickly with water. Uh, sodium, remember as you are going down the groups, as you are going down the group, the, uh, the radius is getting bigger, meaning the electrons are sort of getting free to react now. So sodium, it's going to, it reacts explosively. So it literally explodes when you react it with water and potassium reacts very, very violently. Then you can try out this experiment with the first uh, three elements going down the group, but the other, the others don't, don't you dare. So the reactivity increases down the group. I've explained why this reactivity increases down the group because the atomic radius is increasing and the electrons that are further away are like, yeah, I'm ready to react. So they form ionic compounds. If we talk about um, uh, chemical bonding in a future lecture series, uh, they tend to lose. So most of these uh, form ionic bonds where they 
they can have the ability to bond with non-metals because they are metals themselves and they are going to lose uh, an electron for them to have a stable electronic uh, configuration. So this right there is sodium chloride. So sodium, a metal, reacts with chlorine, a non-metal, to make uh, sodium chloride. And by the way, this is a halogen, no wonder it's uh, diatomic. And in the future, when we do uh, atomic structure and chemical bonding, we're going to say that's sodium plus, that's CO minus, the charge is balanced, electrostatic forces of attraction, this uh, loses one valency, this uh, gains uh, the electron to, to form an anion, this forms a cation, and we have sodium chloride like that. But these two here, Cl2, this subscript two there tells us that there are two chloride, uh, chlorine atoms bonded together via a covalent bond. So we're going to discuss all these different aspects of chemistry in future uh, videos. All right, so let's now talk about the halogens. These halogens that are rather interesting. So fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and uh, astatate. So the first thing that you have to know is that they are diatomic. So every time you are writing an element in a chemical equation and it's a halogen, make sure it's diatomic. Fluoride 2 plus, chlorine 2 plus, bromine 2 plus, iodine 2 plus. These cannot exist independently as monoatomic ions. They are very unstable. You won't find such uh, an arrangement in nature. It will have to share electrons with another element or with itself. So they are always diatomic. All halogens are diatomic. That's a trend. Uh, in terms of, I told you that as you are going down the, as you are going down uh, a group, the atomic radius is increasing because the atomic radius is increasing these elements are starting to get bigger so the first two will be gases then bromine will be a liquid then finally iodine will be solid and all this uh, this applies at this is a room temperature and pressure so as you are going down the group uh yeah you are slowly losing, uh, you are going from gases to liquids and solids. And as you can see, because these uh, atoms, these elements are getting bigger, the boiling point increases down the group, uh, melting point also increases going down the group. So as usual, because they are typically gases and all gases have got low melting points, and low boiling points. All right, so uh, why melting point and boiling point increases going down the group? I just told you that as you are going down the group, the atoms are sort of getting bigger. Because the atoms are getting bigger, they are going to have uh, stronger electrostatic forces of attraction, meaning, remember, gases, that's the structure, liquids, the atoms are sort of uh, sparsely packed, and for solids, they are very closely packed. So as you are moving down, they are getting bigger, they are becoming more solid. So the first two will be gases, then we have got one liquid, then we have got our iron uh, as as a solid like that. So all these will have still. So this point here, which says that the halogen molecules are held together by weak van der Waals forces of attraction. The strength of the weak van der Waals forces of attraction increases as you're going down. So they are not only the van der Waals forces that are holding these atoms together, but they are also uh, intermolecular bonds. So in, in, instead of saying 
um, a weak van der Waals forces of attraction, as you are going, uh, the van der Waals for, of forces of attraction are increasing going down the group, it's better you say that as you are going down the group, the atoms are getting bigger, you're you are sort of uh, going from gases to liquid and solid at room temperature and pressure, meaning you are increasing the intermolecular forces and it will require more energy for you to break down these intermolecular forces. So if you don't want to use a fancy word like van der Waals forces, let's just say uh, intermolecular forces of attraction between individual atoms increases as you are going down the group. Hence, uh, melting point and boiling point increases as you are going down the group in terms of halogens. And actually they start getting darker as you are going down because they're becoming more solid. So fluorine will be sort of pale yellow, fluorine will be greenish, then bromine will be brown, then iodine will be black. So they are even the other one will be black. So as they are going down, the color intensity sort of it gets, it darkens up. Remember, that's also a trend of halogens. You have to know this. So uh, chemical properties, so these are, are in reverse. And uh, halogens react with most metals to form compounds called halides. So every time, for example, uh, sodium chloride is a halide, although it's common salt, so we can typically call them halides because they are compounds that react with halogens. In organic chemistry, there's actually a process called halogenation that we're going to talk about uh, later on. So the weird part about these uh, halogens is that reactivity of the halogens actually decreases going down the groups. It's different from our group one elements. As you are going down, reactivity actually decreases. So this one will be more reactive than that. Um, the iodine will be more reactive than bromide and reactivity just decreases going down the group because uh, the intermolecular forces of attraction, it's becoming more stable, it's becoming more of a solid structure at room temperature and pressure. So as you are going down, you expect reactions not to occur. And we can actually have a more reactive halogen displacing a less reactive halogen. For example, we have got um, an ionic compound here, potassium chloride. And we have got chlorine there. Chlorine is above uh, iodine in terms of halogen arrangement, so meaning it's more reactive. So a more reactive halogen is going to displace a less reactive halogen. So you can see that in this ionic compound there, potassium chloride, the iodine has been displaced by a more reactive halo uh, a halogen, which is chlorine. So a new compound has been formed there, which is potassium chloride, an ionic compound, and the iodine has been displaced. However, as you are going down the group, there will be no reaction. Uh, here there will be no reaction here because bromine is less reactive uh, than chlorine, uh, than, than, than iodide there, so there will be no reaction. So this, the integrity of than, than chlorine, so the integrity of this compound here, potassium chloride, will not be compromised because bromide is not as reactive as chlorine. I hope we're together. Where's my case? All right, so let's talk about the noble gases, the perfect gases. Every time you talk, you hear noble, just think about someone who's like perfect. Someone who doesn't like to fight, they are not that talkative. They are sort of perfect, very angelic, very religious. So these have got a, a complete octet meaning they have got eight valence electrons in their outermost shell with the exception of helium, which has got a perfect two electrons in their outermost shell. They are inert. They, they, are, they are just fine, just being noble gases, non-reactive. So what are some of their physical properties? They are colorless gases. They are probably the only elements on the periodic table that are standalone. 
standalone meaning monoatomic. I can write helium like this uh, in a chemical equation and they'll say, all right, that's a, a, noble, a noble gas. Oh, I can write uh, argon like that in a chemical equation and they'll say, all right, it's monoatomic, it's a noble gas. Very unreactive, very stable electronic configuration. Uh, they have got very low melting and boiling points as expected because they are gases. These are simple trends that you have to know people because uh, what are some of the periodic trends uh, given a specific group? You can say melting point, boiling point, low melting point, high, uh, low melting point, low boiling point, non-reactive. These are very simple questions that will end you max in terms of your, your exam. So some of the, you have to also know some of the uses of these noble gases because they are inert. Uh, the most cool one is your neon light. So you know, the shop is open, the shop is closed. You can use some of your neon lights for advertisements because each element, when you pass an element through an electric field, it's going to have some characteristic color or glow uh, about it. So neon lights, you can use them in your advertisements. Argon can be used to fill these old-fashioned uh, incandescent bulbs, uh, krypton in discharge tubes. But mostly these noble gases are used because they are mostly non-reactive. Transitional metals, very, very tough elements, transition uh, elements. So they form this block over there in the periodic table, very popular block. Uh, all right. So that's the block uh, periods four, five, six, and eight, like four, five, six, and eight. So that's the block of transitional elements. Physical properties, they are very shiny and silvery excellent electrical and uh, thermal conductors when you say thermal it means heat so they are good conductors of electricity and they are good conductors of heat they are good conductors of electricity because they exist in a type of bonding called metallic bonding where you are going to have things known as d log uh, d delocalized electrons or free flowing electrons. So a metallic bond is going to be like a pool of positive charge. A pool of positive charge with like a sea of electrons. And these electrons are able to move around and they can just conduct electricity at will. So these elements are also very hard and strong. Because they are hard and strong, you high density, they will all sink in water. You can heat them, they won't melt easily. You can boil them, they will definitely not start boiling. So you can say they've got a high melting point, high boiling point. So people, these are very examinable questions that you have to all right, so this is what I was saying, high density, high melting point, high boiling point, you have to know their symbols because their symbols will be used for future redox reactions. Because they have got variable charges and variable oxidation states, so if you don't know how to write iron or magnesium or cobalt or nickel or copper, you will probably get a low grade in chemistry because you won't even know how to write the charge on these elements, much less the symbol. So know the symbol of these elements. Where are we, where are we, where are we, where are we? Page 40. So this is what I was saying. They have got vari variable valency and variable oxidation states. So sometimes ion can exist as ion 2 plus, Ion 3 plus, no wonder they sometimes write ion like that. The two in chemical equations, 
or sometimes iron like that with the three in chemical equations, uh, copper plus, copper two plus. That's what this statement is in terms of chemical properties. They have got variable, variable valency and variable oxidation states they are talking about these charges that exist in terms of transitional elements. All right, so catalytic properties, these in terms of things like the harbor process in the in manufacturing of ammonia, you can use these to speed up the rate of the chemical reaction. So they can also be used as catalysts. So, oh, ion, my goodness, I forgot. So harbor process is manufacturing of iron. Oh, I was right. Uh, manufacture of ammonia and the catalyst is iron. Uh, in margarine production, you can use some nickel. Manufacture of nitric acid. So just know uh, as a property, as a chemical property of transitional elements is that they can be used as catalyst in various industrial uh, processes. And they also form ions of variable colors. The most common one that you people might know is copper. Copper is usually blue. Ion has variable colors. Ion two plus is green. Ion three plus is yellow. So they have, they form ions, cations, positively charged ions of variable, of variable uh, colors. All right, so we've come to the end of this lecture. If you enjoyed this lecture, you can share this video with your friends. You can follow my YouTube channel. My contact details are over there in case you might need some personal one-to-one -one tuition. You can call me, you can email me. We'll see you in the next lecture video. Bye for now.